okay, we're recording. So it's week 12, 13, I think 14 for some, but mostly it's week 12 or 13 for us uh, within lockdown. So um, it's really great to see so many familiar faces and also to see some new faces as well. Um, as you know, and are experiencing right now, COVID-19 has had a profound effect upon um, all of us, personal, professional lives. Sorry, you've gone mood now. Thank you. Ever, <laughs> since, ever since it literally came, it came into our lives you know, 12, 13, 14 weeks ago, um, at Action Duchenne, we've been watching the developments really, really closely. And as soon as it kicked in, we made really significant changes to the way that we deliver our support to our families across the UK. So we were really, really mindful of making sure we used our resources in an incredibly positive way to help everybody. So with this in mind, we developed a series of Duchenne webinars, which this is the 13th that we've um, brought to you guys. Um, some of the faces online tonight have been to pretty much all 13. So um, hats off to you guys, they said very dedicated. Uh, we've also regularly updated uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID advice page for uh, families living with Duchenne. And that's actually just been updated today with the new shielding guidance as well from Neil, our um, head of research. We've also been contacting all of our families one-to-one. -one. That's been Sam's job over the past 13 weeks. She's contacted over a thousand families one-to-one -one and been offering support, shoulder to cry on, um, and advice as well um, for everybody. So on to tonight's webinar. I'm really, really pleased to bring this to you guys. Um, I'm so delighted that, that um, Dr. Spinty and Alison have agreed to do this for us. So thank you so much. Um, the way that the webinars run is Sam and I are both Duchenne parents. We're not techie. <laughs> we're not, we're not to completely technologically minded. So we try to keep this as, as relaxed as possible. Uh, feel free to type your messages in the messaging box, um, which is down the bottom um, um, in the taskbar. If you would prefer to ask some anonymous questions at any time, do please send that to me directly. But we will, um, I, myself or Sam, will pose the questions to the speakers at appropriate intervals throughout the webinar. So um, tonight, this is your opportunity to share your thoughts, ask questions of some of the best, ex or the, the most well-renowned experts you know, in the country, certainly the world. Um, it gives me a huge pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Stefan Spinty. Um, consultant paediatric neurologist and at the Neuromuscular Centre of Excellence, Alderhey Children's Hospital in Liverpool. So Dr Spinty is a very long time friend of Action Duchenne. He's a regular at the conferences every year. Um, and last year, I had to put this in, he impressed the youngsters by playing the guitar. He just walked straight in, picked up the guitar and started playing in the hangout, which was actually the highlight. I know for Sam, that was her highlight of the whole Absolutely. weekend. Um, so Dr Spinty is hugely knowledgeable and dedicated to the muscular dystrophy community. So we thank you for all the work that you do for, for our families. Um, Dr. Spinty will share his expertise and help you to understand how to get the most out of your online clinician appointments. Dr. Spinty will be joined by Alison Shillingham, uh, Shillington, who is Senior Mu Neuromuscular Physiotherapist, who will speak about how to make the most of your online physiotherapy appointments. Um, welcome both. Thank you so much. And Dr. Spinty, I will pass it over to you for you to share your screen thank you so very thank much you. thank you very much so if i press share screen um let me just get the right one is this on your screen now because i lost it now it's looking Can you good see the screen yeah it's perfect okay. yeah good. thank you so so most important all this um should be a relaxed session at this time of the day and um i don't mind at all if you interrupt i've prepared a, a, a very short presentation but if you've got questions as i go along then um, by all means just um chip in uh, um, i don't know whether there's a facility to raise your hand or i don't mind if you just speak up um, and what we'll do dr spinty is I'll, I'll actually keep my eyes peeled on the waiting on the um the chat box yeah. So that if um, if anybody has a question, I can just pop it in the chat box. Um, yeah. If anybody has difficulties, I will keep an eye out for them raising their hand and, and we'll take it from there. Fine. So uh, just a little bit of background. I'm a paediatric neurologist, as um, some of you might know, and I've been the lead clinician for the neuromuscular service now <clears throat> for 16, 17 years here at, at Alderhey and before trained with Anne-Marie Childs and the 
excellent neuromuscular team in Leeds. So been in this um, area for for quite a while. Now in Leeds, um, I had the opportunity to get formal training on telephone clinics, um, which was the only form really of telemedicine. Um, video links were just emerging um, some 15, well, actually 18, 19 years ago, but they've become more sophisticated now. So um, ever since I've started here in Liverpool almost 17 years ago, I've done, I've run a weekly formal telephone clinic, which I must say has worked extremely well and has um, um, been beneficial to um, many families who um, very much appreciate it. There are some um, um, learning lessons, I think, from it. One of it is that um, it's important to feel comfortable um, when you do telephone consultations or video link consultations. I've had a recent number of families who felt a bit un uncomfortable with um, being on the video, um, but, but I think people, more and more people get um, used to it. Um, so let me just see whether I can move the presentation forward. And I seem to have lost the... Don't worry, this is the stage where Sam and I do a, a little dance, don't we, Sam, in between slides. So, that's it. Yeah, so I can't, um, for some reason... Yes, there we are. So, um, this is a slide most of you will have seen in one form or the other over the years. This was very originally um, started off by Anne-Marie Trides in, in Leeds and um, she allowed me to um, change and add to the slide, which I have done year by year. And the one thing you, when you go through all the teams involved in, in work with um, children with neuromuscular um, conditions and um, the dystrophinopathies, of course, is the one thing which is missing is the IT department. So when I revise the slide this time, I will add the IT department because uh, they've started to have a um, really significant impact. Um, so you can see there are a large number of people involved um, and groups and teams involved. And the, the job of the neuromuscular service, the neuromuscular team is to coordinate it all, um, which we've done for many years with um, joint MDT clinics, um, and ha having agreed to take over the surveillance of all aspects um, in the um, in the dystrophinopathy care. So, what is telemedicine? Um, it's a kind of posh word, but essentially, it's um, um, telephone calls, either via landline or mobile. And um, there are good things about one thing and good things about the other. So, landline, the negative thing is that you're um, stuck to the the place where your telephone sits. <clears throat> the mobile is more mobile, as it says, but sometimes the, the connection is not so great, the reception. Um, and the other form are video links. Um, and there are um, different programs now how to do this. Uh, the most simple of forms, which I have done with a fair number of consultation, is to um, switch on the video on your mobile phone. Um, and in that way, be able to quickly look at, look at a gate, for example, or a skin rush or um, a, um, a new medicine label, this kind of thing, which, which also works very well. So it can be um, done in a very simple way if the posh um, applications which um, have been around now, like MS Teams or the Attend Anywhere, um, don't work. So I've done a, a number of consultations with MS Teams. I've only and deliberately only done one consultation with Attend Anywhere, which at the time failed halfway through. Um, so I think Attend Anywhere is an excellent software, but it needs a little bit of brushing up. Um, and we've just had a, an audit internally um, run by our management team. And three of the colleagues who've used Attend Anywhere the most have come back with a fairly decent list of things which need to be improved upon. And I think that has been um, forwarded to the developer. Um, um, these um, video link um, um, consultations, of course, require that you download the software, so it needs a bit of pre-preparation. Pre and from our organization point of view, it is actually significantly more intense, labor intense, work intensive 
compared to telephone consultation. So for the telephone consultations, I only need your telephone number and then I can ring you. Ideally, I've got two, so one is a backup. And as one of the next slides will tell you, it is a good idea to have your mobile charged um, if you're expecting a telephone call. Um, for the MS team and attend anywhere, we need your email address and then we need to send you um, the, um, the link and then you need to link in and download it onto your computer and log in. And then um, for attend anywhere, certainly you, you will be in a waiting room and then we'll be asked to come in almost as if you're in clinic. The problem with that seems to be at times that this doesn't quite work. So people drop out of the waiting room and then they, they are lost somewhere in cyberspace and can't join again. So that has caused some frustration, but if you bear with us and, and wait for these technologies to be further um, developed, then, then I think it, it will become a lot easier soon. The MS Teams is pretty easy. You get an invitation, you click on the link, and then you're in. There, there's no waiting room and, or anything like this. So those are essentially the options. And I think before you embark and agree on telephone um, or telemedicine participation, um, just give it a thought what you feel you are most comfortable with. Uh, with. There are a few people who don't like um, um, telephone calls or telemedicine at all. Actually, the majority probably are completely comfortable and that certainly is my experience sometimes even more comfortable than than a face-to-face -face, um, consultation so um what is always important i think is to be clear what um you expect and what the purpose of the of the respective consultations are and i know that um we are not always 100 percent clear when we send outpatient appointment and certainly since the appointment systems have changed at all hey it has been a um, good source of frustration um, that families get a clinic letter, but it doesn't actually tell you exactly with whom, sometimes not even which team and what the purpose of it is. And sometimes um, people have been invited to um, consultations which actually they don't, didn't need to come to. But um, that is something which we can make clear and um, should be clear in the in invitation. So, for example, there are the full routine multidisciplinary um, clinic consultations, like you know exactly from the face-to-face -face consultation. So they said in my in our books, they should be exactly the same like the um, consultations you come to for the face-to-face -face appointment. And then there are, um, is the question, is it a full consultation or is it really just a or just in inverted commas, a problem targeted um, consultation. So a lot of the consultations I do and have done over the years are targeted. So families phone in, phone my secretary or as they are called now, um, pathway coordinators um, and say this and this is happening, I need some advice or I want to discuss it with a member of the team. And then our pathway coordinator, um, secretary Julie, she's directing them to the appropriate person within the neuromuscular team. So it might be that some advice from physio is required or the occupational therapist or um, the psychologist. And then um, specific consultations are organized with the respective team members, or of course with a consultant or um, um, senior um, registrar or fellow. We also run nurse-led clinics like in many um, uh, um, other neuromuscular services and therapy-led um, clinics. So Alison, for example, for years now as a senior neuromuscular physiotherapist has run not just her um, and the um, uh, um, physiotherapy clinic, but also has taken on a quite significant number of um, standard follow-up appointments following the um, standard regime, because we've got um, so many um, families who um, benefit from the services but there aren't enough um, consultants in the moment, as you probably know. The neuromuscular care advisors run their clinics slightly differently, but they can be organized in a very similar, and they are organized in a very similar way. They are mainly telephone consultations also in our institution. So um, before the consultation, um, I think it's important to be clear of um, for you and not to get frustrated of, of, of when the um, consultation actually is. So some units run exact consultation times, which then restricts you, in my experience, 
if there's an additional question, like in a normal um, arbitration appointments, if you've got an additional question or there's another issue which want to be raised or um, the person affected by a neuromuscular condition would like a, a, a discussion on, on his own um, without parents or carers there, um, that requires a little bit more time. So I've adapted over the years to have a flexible approach. So our families know I will phone within a time frame. So my um, standard telephone clinic runs on a Friday. Families are very much aware that it is extremely rare that I start calling at 1.30 when I'm supposed to and finish at five. So it's much more likely that I start calling at 4.30 or five or even 5.30, 6 o'clock, and then the telephone clinic runs into 8 o'clock or later. It's not so great for me, but it seems that it's um, it's quite liked by the families. <laughs> so every time I, I ask whether it's still all right, they say, that's fine, and the kids are in bed, and you know, everybody, everybody's settled on the Friday afternoon. Um, so later in the evening seems to work best and, and probably better for families. <clears throat> It's always good to ha have a check of your equipment. So check whether your phone works and you've paid your bids and your computer works and the camera, um, if you've got a video link before the appointment. Make sure you've got a backup um, a telephone number to call. So that's true for both phone, but also video link. If it fails, then um, we will just call you back. And I think there just needs to be clarity and it's worthwhile to clear this, uh, or to clarify this with your um, team. Um, because if you try and ring us back, it usually doesn't work. But if we've got a number, um, it's pretty easy. Then something to jot something down, pen and paper traditionally, or an iPad or electronic device. To have previous clinic letters in front of you always is helpful. I think it just guides you through the um, consultation, in particular if it's a complete um, full review. If you could have a recent wait, um, even if it's not maybe 100% accurate, it would really be helpful. Um, if you've got scales at home, then just wait before the clinic or uh, maybe um, a wait from school or educational environment or a respite unit um, will do. And then we can um, compare this to previous ones. There are other observations we would normally do in, in the clinic environment, which aren't really so easy, but in fact, um, when one actually looks at it, um, most of those like heart rate or respiratory rate can be easily measured if there are um, pre-existing concerns. Some individuals have got saturation monitors because they use um, non-invasive or invasive ventilation, for example, to have the ventilator settings, information on feeds, for example, um, all of this is, is helpful. Most of this will be documented in the previous letter, so it gives you a guide of what um, you should um, summarize. Um, in the moment, as you probably heard, um, forced vital capacity and peak cough flow um, um, is really restricted because it's aerosol producing procedure. Um, there are some ways around it. We, for example, like many other units, look in the moment at devices which can be bought for the individuals in their home environment. I think that's fine for the experienced older person. For the younger children, Alison might make a comment on that later on. For the younger child, I think it's difficult. They're gonna struggle and um, the, the measurements might not be so accurate. Having said this, if you start early with this, um, the learning curve in most children tend to be pretty steep. So it might be something we will do more frequently in the future. We have just been lucky um, and um, got funding for um, I've lost my screen. Can you still see it or? We've lost it temporarily. Here we go. Okay. It's back. And, and we also have some happen. questions for the next break, Dr. Spinty. So yeah. Yeah. No, you can stop me any time if I go on too long. Um, no, no, no. You carry on, and we'll um just. And I'll, I'll let me know when yeah. you're ready. And I can. Uh, there's some really cracking questions coming through. So. so if you if you keep a problem list, um, any of your particular concerns. Um, that would be helpful before the consultation and jot those down. You can either send them over via email or let the secretaries know, but if you've got handy for the consultation. And then also if you think videos or photos would be helpful, you can forward them to the team. Um, shall we look at some questions? Let's do that. So, really, really good question from um, a Dushen mum. How secure are the modes of video calling? 
she's aware of security breaches within Zoom. I'm probably not the right person to speak to this. We have um, been advised by our um, safeguarding team. We've had um, 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 discussions about this. Um, so what is the recommendations in the moment are that um, um, any videos or photos of intimate areas, for example, are not permitted and we're very strict about this. Um, I think my approach would be if there's anything you um, would be concerned about um, that it would be shared with with other people who are um, um, not intended to hear or know about something, then it probably should not be cons um, discussed in a um, video consultation because they might not be as secure as they as they are supposed to be. I think WhatsApp um, is supposed to be secure if it's end-to-end -end security. I think telephone calls, unless MI5 or MI6 um, <laughs> get <You> infested. <laughs> yeah, um, so certain words probably shouldn't be used, but um, um, if those are avoided, then then I think telephone consultations are safe in my books. And actually, it's a it's a human right, as far as I know, um, to have un unwatched consultations. Yeah. So that's probably all I can say about that. Okay. Um, another question: um, Are online appointments like this expected to continue up to the new year? Yes, so the way, um, and again, different units um, handle it probably slightly different, but I think overall, we are all pretty much the same. So we have converted all face-to-face um, um, -face appointments in our neuromuscular team to, um, to um, telephone or telemedicine appointments in one form or the other. And we use them as screening. And then one of the questions we always ask um, in these appointments is, is there a need for a face-to-face -face appointment? And if there is, we discuss in great detail what it would involve, i.e. coming. So in the moment, we've really reduced the clinic attendance. So the hospital is pretty empty, um, um, the foyer, the waiting room area, the clinic rooms. So I normally see, for example, 25 children, adolescents, young adults per week um, at a probably minimum. And I'm reduced to down to three in the moment per week face-to-face -face appointments. Um, so we use these face-to-face -face appointments um, for um, issues which can't be resolved um, in telephone consultations or video links, can't be resolved with videos or photos. But it's quite interesting to see how much um, actually can. Um, so we do selected invitations. So we've not stopped face-to-face -face appointments. And, um, as I understand it, the capacity for face-to-face -face appointments is currently being increased um, week by week, probably. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, Alison um, wants to add to that, um, Dr. Spinty. So, um, Alison, are you there? Okay, I'll ask the next question as well, and then we'll yeah. come back to Alison. Yeah. So um, another Duchenne mum has asked, will she get a chance to come for a face-to-face -to, -face to do checks that she can't do over the phone um, once we all get back to some form of normal? Yes, definitely. So we are in the moment um, in the process of reinstating the regular routine um, surveillance appointments for um, cardiac, so echocardiogram, ECG, um, for the bone mineral density scan, the DEXA scans, the blood tests in particular for vitamin D levels, regular um, renal tests, if in particular if you're on, um, um, for example, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. Um, so all of this will um, be done. Um, the aim is that um, any of the routine surveillance or examination investigations which should be done on clinical grounds um, are done. So we are not compromising on clinical care. And I know there have been delays and things, but we, for example, have had um, a, a sh small number of boys who um, unfortunately had a um, bone fracture. They were seen straight away. They came, the procedure is just, just slightly different. So the appointments are all there. The A&E departments are open. Um, and the neuromuscular teams are all there. So um, there should not be, there might be delay. And what we have done 
um, is to look at who has had the echocardiogram and ECG, for example, when, um, and whether there's any clinical um, need. So we do yearly, um, for example, cardiac um, screening tests. Um, so we watch this very carefully that the delay in, in these routine surveillance um, investigation is not too long. So um, just following on from that point, uh, what is regarded as clinical grounds? Um, the, so, the, the Duchenne parent has said um, that to her mind it's all necessary. Yeah, so, so our surveillance system we've developed in the UK is a pretty tight system. Um, so if you, if you get yearly um, echocardiograms and ECGs, um, some people argue they are not necessary in the young children. We've always done them from diagnosis at Oidehe, and I think it's a reasonable thing. Um, and you get into routine, but it also means that there's that there's a kind of leeway. So um, in the appointments, it, it really, on cl uh, clinically, it doesn't really matter whether you've got the echocardiogram a, a month or two earlier or later. But what we've tried to aim for is a reasonable routine um, um, routine appointments for screening. On clinical grounds means that, for example, if a, if a, young, uh, if a young man affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy complains about um, 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 palpitations, then I would hope that um, that person or um, the family or carers would ring us up and say, look, you know, this is a new symptoms, what shall we do about it? And I would then um, um, liaise with our um, cardiac department and get, for example, a 24-hour tape or an um, ECG done um, um, as a matter of um, priority. And the same is true for, um, for other investigations. Um, so if you're, for example, on, on ACE inhibitors um, and you have become dehydrated and there's a concern that it might affect the kidney function, we get, we get your electrolytes done straight away and your renal function straight away to see whether we need to stop or um, reduce the ACE inhibitors. Thank you. And that's the questions for now, so thank you very much. Okay, should I just continue then with a few more slides? Yeah. Yes, please do. So um, at the beginning of the consultation, just make sure that you say who you are and you should expect that the doctor or um, team member should say who they are and who is participating in the consultation. It can be quite irritating sometimes if, if you realize that they're actually several members of the team in the room in the consultation and you weren't aware of it. And the same is of course true for um, you and your family. So if you say um, um, grandma is within in the room and, and who the relation, what the relationship is. Um, so just a, a comment on recording or videoing consultation. So this is not custom and it's not kind of agreed. So I think if you do wish to, to do this, you you should let the um, the team know. We don't record any consultations as a as a rule, but if you do wish to record, just let us know, and then we can either say yes or no. But it does require consent from the respective parties, and that certainly is trust policy um, uh, here at Order Hay. Um, during the consultations, um, make some notes as you normally would. Um, ask whether um, any questions um, you, you would normally ask, make sure they are answered. Um, and in consultation, we would normally check this at the end. Um, then um, as you normally would do, just be clear about what the next outpatient appointments are. So it is irritating for you as, as families and individuals to need to phone the appointment clerks and they don't know or phone the secretaries. So, um, and also that includes any subspecialities um, because different systems or different teams work differently. And that includes the, the routine dates for surveillance and the question which was just asked, you know, what is, is urgent or important on clinical um, ground is exactly this. So we, for example, have postponed most DEXA scans because the bone mineral density scans and the results don't influence clinical care. Um, so in the moment we've only just, re or we are just restarting doing those. Um, and then also, of course, any upcoming treatment dates. Some individuals are on regular bisphosphonates like um, resitronate, for example, or um, testosterone um, treatment monthly. 
so you would you would be keen to know when those dates are um keep a list of the task and the questions you or we agreed to be answered for the next appointment normally you should receive a clinic letter i know that um quite a number like me we are delayed with doing our letters but eventually they should come through are there any questions to that so then what oh, is, oh, we, we have a couple actually i beg your pardon sorry yeah, um so question from leanne are these tests carried out in house and what are the current risks um and also uh from susan how long is the in, the appointment expected to last um so what is your kind of scheduled time so appointments for full review appointments tend to be um 40 minutes an hour at all hey but this varies in in different institution new patients appointments are in the neuromuscular service are an hour at least depending on the complexity but we find that often if if things have changed for example then it just needs a little bit more time but i think 40 45 minutes is probably or you know 30 minutes to 40 45 minutes is probably reasonable depending on whether a full review is done or not sorry what was the second question the um, it was about the test the tests. being carried out in house yes and yes what the current so so we've, um, like most other units, have um, changed the appointment or have gone to an appointment system for blood tests, for example. They are all pre-organized. The number of individuals in the, for example, um, phlebotomy department where the blood is taken or in the radiology department for the DEXA scan or x-rays is all very limited. So the contact really, and I think that is true for all the units I certainly know of, the contact um, is, is absolutely minimal in the in the hospital um, some tests like for example finger prick blood tests can be done in the home environment and there are community nursing teams both in pediatric and adult services who are able to facilitate this to minimize um, needing to leave the house so that again can be negotiated and i would um i, I would urge you if you have got concerns discuss it um with the respective teams i think what we have seen, um, I can't um, really comment on the adult side, but in pediatrics, I think there have been quite a number of families and um, boys and young men who've become not surprisingly rather anxious in the last three, four months. Um, and and that is, you know, it, it's a kind of normal response if you if you've been unwell and you're in in your house for a week or two, when you then go out. Um, it feels very strange to be in the in the real world again. Um, so it's not surprising, and and of course with conflicting advice and the uncertainties um, in the past about COVID-19, um, um, a lot of anxiety has arisen. I think as the knowledge increases, like for example that we now know that children are a lot less affected, for example, um, and um, at least get some reassurance that there haven't been, to my knowledge, any severe cases of COVID-19 in, um, in people affected by dystrophinopathies, for example, um, that people are talking more and more now about the um, steroids and the previous concerns that um, the doses of steroids which are used in, um, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy would um, increase potentially the risks for COVID-19. That doesn't seem to have um, translated into the reality. And in fact, actually, the um, oncologists tell me that even in their patient group where one have suspected um, an increased risk from COVID-19 in children, um, they haven't seen that either. So they are changing their guidelines. This doesn't mean that we um, should not um, um, practice social or physical distancing. I think that's of most importance and um, wash hands and disinfect surfaces. But um, that shielding might not be required for um, significant proportion of, of the population, we think. So no further questions at okay. the moment. So I've listed, um, for, if this might be of interest, I thought a, a typical comprehensive systematic consultation. So not every consultation needs to cover every topic, but if you want to um, keep this as a list, um, feel free. It just um, might work as an aid memoir um, so 
that you know there should be a problem list observations maybe some discussion about general health hospital admissions i always think that the system inquiry is one of the most important parts of any consultation because this is where you detect whether um, sleep pattern has changed or whether there have been emerging difficulties with chewing or swallowing or whether constipation is, is an ongoing problem. And pain discomfort, I think, as you know, we've kind of in commas neglected for a while, but people um, are more focused on this issue about puberty and should testosterone injections be started, the um, potential risk of adrenal insufficiency. Um, we always have a warning um, paragraph in our clinic letters. And then, of course, the um, review of appliances, wheelchair uh, adaptations, and so forth. Um, participation in research are put at the at the end. This is a very fast um, moving field, as you know, and um, we've um, made it kind of standard in our clinics to have a, a, a brief few minutes on research and whether any of the individuals um, who come are potentially eligible for participation in trial or not. Um, now I've lost the ability. There we are. So last slide, the pitfalls, a mobile battery flat, so that's not an unusual. <laughs> so suddenly the line just goes blank. Um, noisy background environment, um, barking dogs um, are um, sometimes difficult or when it's late in the evening and the other children kick up a fuss because they're tired and hungry that is something to consider. So I sometimes have to apologize for the late call um, because everybody is tired. Um, and if I haven't got, if we haven't got a backup telephone number, then um, I can't phone back if the line is interrupted, for example. And I think that is um, it from my point. Any other questions? Not at the moment. Um, okay. We were hoping to have um, Alison, Join you as you know. Um, yeah. Everybody. Can, I just, has, can you hear me now? Oh, you're there. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Hello, oh, Alison. We've been panicking. I'm so pleased Hello. to be. That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to take myself off mute and um, just give me instructions about the, the slide. So, everybody, this is Alison. Um, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I've worked uh, alongside Dr. Spinty for about 17 years now. Um, in or purely in neuromuscular field. So what I would say to you is that this is as new to us as it is to you. Um, and there is always pitfalls like we've had tonight whereby I can't actually get any video at all and I've had to come in by telephone. So um, together we will get through it. Um, and we, we all have different uh, abilities in the technological field and mine is quite low. But it does work, I have done it, and the Attend Anywhere system and the Microsoft Soft Team systems do work, and they're the NHS um, recommended ones, and they tend to be the most secure ones. Every hospital has different guidelines, but certainly um, they're the two systems for the lady that was concerned about security that the NHS has seen to be secure enough to use. Um, as Dr. Spinty said before, there are several avenues available to us to actually show you or, or take you through the uh, clinics. We can do by telephone, which is the problem, biggest problem with that is that I have no sight of your child and as a physiotherapist, it's really hard to assess your child if I can't see them. Um, we have live video, which is great, but because of the delay on live video, we can't do any timed testing, which we do need to use for some of the natural history data that we collect nationally. Uh, and then recorded video is great for time testing, but we, we can't see your patient live as, as it was. Um, so in essence, it's probably best to have a mix of live and recorded video, but that's asking even more of you as parents. Uh, I think the most important thing of all from everybody's perspective is preparation. And if you could put up the, um, Lynette, if you could put up the slide about preparation for therapists, is that okay? Yep, will do. Okay, that should be there. Sam, is that the one? The one? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go for it, Alison. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm still seeing a different one, but I'm assuming the preparation for therapists is up. And I just really wanted to flash this one up to show you that, that there's a lot of prep on our side as well as your side, really. So there's seven points of prep there for um, for everybody to, to look at. Then, uh, then if we next go to the, the prep for parents, can we see that one? I just think that everybody's seen that. Has everybody read that slide and is everyone happy for me to move on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can I can only see the positions one as well. So have have the one for prep for therapists not gone up? Yes, I I, I showed that one. Um Okay, right. So the next one is the prep for families, please. Here we are. Okay, so so if I, I just run briefly through this. From my perspective, you can identify your concerns before the consultation. I can deal with them to start with because that can sometimes interfere with the testing that we want to do with the child. Um, if necessary, take videos and photographs related to your concerns that you can send to us either before or after the consultation. You need to clear a floor space that's big enough for your child to lie on the floor. Everybody is, uh, Lynette, everybody is only seeing the slide that says starting positions for the physiotherapy assessment, which is the one that we've not got to yet. Okay. Give me a few seconds. Sorry, everybody. So you should now be able to see Brilliant. the preparation for video clinic for therapists. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that's great and I really I mean that's not really for parents to, to look at that that's just so that you know that we have as much prep to do as you really and um, that's that's what we ask our physiotherapists to do before they do a video video assessment okay now if you change now to the prep for families please it's happening Okay. It's on the positions one, Lynette. You put positions back on again rather than preparation for families, please. There we go. Brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant. I, I, can everybody see that now? Yeah. Okay. So, as I said before, if you can identify your concerns and if necessary, take videos before the consultation, that's really, really helpful from our point of view because that can sometimes interfere with what we want to test your child with. You need to clear a floor space that's big enough for your child to lie on the floor. So one of my poor therapists has had to set their house up and the left picture shows what it's normally like and she has cleared the floor for the assessment and you're going to need a reasonable amount of space. You need enough space for your child to be able to lie down and stand up freely, okay? Obviously, if your child is a wheelchair user full time, then we need full vision of the wheelchair. So you still need quite a significant space. Is that all right? So the left-hand picture is not big enough. The right-hand picture, um, yes, that's fantastic. And then if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see that we asked you to actually test your video skills and your equipment to make sure that you can get that floor space in view quite clearly. Um, can everybody else see a full screen? Is it just me that's only got half a screen? Okay, so you need to check that you can actually video what you need to video. And there, there's a picture of Sarah with her uh, iPad, making sure that she can get the whole of us done in the video camera there. Okay, and if you keep going down, the next picture we have is of a hallway, which is really important if we're going to do walk and run. So there should be a page two of that, Lynette, yeah? That's it, brilliant. Okay, so again, poor Sarah, that's a hall normally. And then on the right-hand side is what we'd like you to clear for us. Now, I fully appreciate that not everybody's got a hall, and we will do what we can and what we can't, we won't. Um, and that's just the way it goes, okay? Another point is to make sure that your child is in suitable clothing, okay? So we don't want them swaddled up in so many clothes that we can't see how anything's working, but we also don't want them half naked. So shorts and a vest or shorts and t-shirts, like they were going to do a PE lesson, allows us to see what's moving and what's not moving, okay? If you can 
warn the rest of the family that this is going to take place because it's quite hard work for the children to do the physio assessment. But then most of the children will be used to doing them. It's nothing that they've never done before. Um, so they know what they're going to be asked of, but it's a different setting with different people. I'm not there encouraging them to do it. And quite often, um, they'll do more for me perhaps than they would for their mums, sometimes, not always. Um, but if you can minimise the disruption to the family and warn the children that this is coming, that's really, really helpful. Um, it really isn't helpful if the dog comes and starts licking the child's face whilst they're lying on the floor trying to get help quickly. Um, so that's a big point. Um, the other thing is that we'd like you to have a list of check positions, and certainly I send this out to my parents, um, and that's the, the, the picture, the other one, please, starting positions for the physiotherapy assessment, please, Lynette. Yep, I will do that just now. These um these changes of slides take a slight moment. I think I'm battling with the Wi-Fi, right. which is um uh, so the the picture of the little chap. Yes, standing up looking a bit dumb. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Brilliant. Okay. So the data that we collect from the physiotherapy assessments that, that your children have done is collected nationally, as you all know, to go on the North Star database, which is a natural history database, and that's been incredibly useful for the research projects that are going on at the moment. It's, it's given us a huge bank of data. So because it's a national database, all your therapists are trained together. We're all assessed against each other, but it also means that the movements that the children do that we're assessing have to be quite accurate which is why we're quite firm with the children when we do it. And there are set start and finish positions for them. And if we can get the start positions right, so this is a bit of a crib sheet, and there will be starting positions for your child that we'll ask you to adopt. So again, I would send this out to my parents, and I'm more than happy to share it with anybody and everybody. Okay, it's not it's not um, just the other hey children. Um, that's why we, we have to be so precise with the starting position. So if you have a quick look at the way Dara is sitting, uh, I've tried to show you what's not right and what is right. So there is a variety of positions that you'll have to do. And if we can scroll down, please, onto page two, Lynette. Brilliant. Um, this is one of the hardest, particularly as a therapist, step up, step down is one of the hardest to assess. Um, it's actually easier on video because you can replay it, but this will be being done live, I would imagine. Not everybody has a stair that's compatible, so Sarah has been provided with a bag of compost. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as we have got visual to see a child get up onto a, um, a small step and down with a small step we can do the assessment and get it right you have to be a little bit creative which is oh she's obviously been out into the garden and fetched um fetched a bag of compost in which works really well because it's quite firm and solid and then if you scroll down to page three alice I'm, I'm surprised she could get hold of compost it was like gold dust isn't it a couple of weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> it's just scrolling down it's coming again. Sorry, I, I think the guys are watching Avengers or something, so it's um, I'm, I'm battling with the Wi-Fi again. There we go. Brilliant. Okay, this is one of the most important positions because we do quite a few assessments that start in this position. So again, it's just having that, knowing what is the good position to start. Okay, um, it is a learning curve. Um, I think the most important thing what we have. To that we have to remember is that the health of the child is the most important thing and we need to know how your child is doing. Getting good data and good results to go on the national database is important, but not as important as the health of your child. So this is secondary. And if we can do it, we can do it. And if we can't, well, we can't, okay? Um, there are bound to be video clinics that work well, and there's bound to be ones that don't, okay? And technology fails. Children are not happy in the different environments. Children wouldn't comply like they would normally because it's a changed format. And it's also important that we know how your child copes with 
doing this, it's important to us to know how they got on because we can adapt and change, okay? Um, so reassure them that they're doing brilliantly. As I say, most of the boys have done this several times before and they know the format and once they get into the swing of it, I would imagine that they'll be fine. Um, as Dr. Spinty said before, another big test that we do is the respiratory testing. And unfortunately, that is very challenging at the moment because if we do one, we have to fully gown, fully visor, and then and empty the room for an hour afterwards because it's an aerosol generating procedure. So that is massive. It's not nice for the children to see us in full kit. Um, and it, it also is a terrible, terrible waste of time. Uh, so we are looking into home kits. But we would probably select two we gave the home kit two, in that we would they're very expensive. We would be choosing families um, where we know the children are at risk from respiratory issues. So it, 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 it wouldn't we wouldn't dream of giving them out to everybody. But we will be asking you to show your child how to take a deep breath, how he takes a deep breath, and we'd want that on the video. We'd also want to hear your child coughing on the video. We may even ask them to shout at us down the video so we can hear the power behind the voice. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I'm sorry I've rattled through and I'm sorry you can't see me. Um, uh, anybody got any questions for me? Thank you so much. That was brilliant. I'm so glad you managed to join us. Honestly, my face, I was, I was beaming. <laughs> uh, this, these are the challenges we face and this is going to happen during video calls. Mm -hmm. and I don't think we need to get too upset about it. I, no. I was getting a little stressed tonight. Um, but it does happen that, that somebody's Wi-Fi signal is not strong enough, which is, I think, what has happened with me tonight. So I've um, got two questions. Um, one from Leanne. Leanne, I'm just kind of trying to get um, to ask the right question. It's about adrenal um, crisis. Um, so um, I think that Leanne has received the emergency pack on the adrenal uh, on adrenal crisis from Bosch. Um, are you are you guys sending um, something similar out from Alderhay, or do you think is, is it just is it just um, um, London and the Gosh area? So uh, this is a, again another um, area where I think <clears throat> the neuromuscular um, um, teams and groups as a whole have um, caused some confusion. I think in the attempt to um, respond as quick and as best as we possibly can. I think one of the important things um, is, uh, first of all, to say that there are very, very few um, children, adolescents, young adults, adults who actually have had adrenal crisis. So for the Northwest region, which is um, from the neuromuscular population larger than Greater London, in the 17 years I've been here, I know of one child who had a proper adrenal crisis due to um, inability to take um, the steroids due to severe diarrhea and vomiting. And the reason why the child um, got into adrenal crisis was that he wasn't actually brought to medical attention until day three or four, and then he did need intensive care. But this was the only event I know about. We've had um, for the Old Hay area, um, three children, uh, three adolescents really in, um, um, in our region who had mild symptoms of kind of lethargy, not, not recovering kind of 100% from a viral infection. And they, the parents appropriately phoned us up and we, we checked um, electrolytes and blood pressure and um, it did a, what is called a short synaptin test. And on that test, they showed a low adrenal response. So um, I think that the, the risk for proper adrenal crisis is pretty low. Um, and the, the other issue is that there's a difference between whether you work in a relatively densely populated area, meaning that the next um, hospital is whatever, half an hour, 45 minutes away, or whether you live in the middle of Scotland and you've got no access to immediate health care. So that is a different consideration. Um, we have got in our clinic letters um, what we call a steroid warning, which means that if you are on if you're on regular steroids, and all of these steroids doses are what we call supra physiological. So the doses your children or any individual receives are higher than what the normal um, 
um, um, and body would produce. Um, so unless there's an interruption of um, individuals being able to take the steroids or to absorb them, like for example in very severe diarrhea, then there shouldn't really be a risk of um, adrenal crisis. Um, so if you come under stress, um, say that you've got a fracture or um, unfortunately develop a pneumonia or other significant severe infection, then that is a time where um, increased doses of steroids might be required. The most important bit to uh, avoid problems is to seek medical advice. Um, so whether COVID-19 um, situation pandemic or not, this would be a situation where um, you either call the, the neuromuscular or your team, the neuromuscular team doing working hours for advice, or if you're seriously concerned, you um, call for an ambulance or you department and seek advice. Um, and if then um, it is decided that in Sam, we're going to need you to uh, do your song and dance again, dear. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I was just going to come on and say, right, it's, it, you're up, Lynette, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're back, Dr. Spinty. Carry on, please. We missed the last kind of 10 seconds or so. Oh, so um, the neuromuscular um, teams have, or some of the neuromuscular teams have sent out intramuscular hydrocortisone. Um, and that was for the fear that um, emergency services and A&E departments might not be readily available. But I think um, we can truly say that that luckily has not been the case and anybody who needs emergency care um, has received emergency care. So we at Order Hay, um, because we are living in one of the densest um, populated areas and we've got a large number of hospitals readily available and A&E departments, we have opted not to send out emergency packs to everybody, but have issued um, emergency intramuscular hydrocortisone to a few families, small number of families who have requested this. So it's not about um, that it can't be done and given, but it was also one of the things which probably has raised anxiety leverage. Um, and it is a bit uncertain whether it was actually necessary. But as long as everybody is aware that who is on regular steroid therapy um, needs to be considered if the steroid can't be taken or they can't be absorbed or there's a concern about a high stress situation like for example a severe infection or a fractured limb. Um, and you know I think what, what the parent what the mum was saying here was that um, they've been asked to train to give intramuscular injections and she's finding it really frightening. Um, and yeah. also to try to treat to di um, and diagnose hypoglycemia, um, she just feels it's a real kind of potential for panic, um, along with you know kind of trying to diagnose and yes. treat yeah. it, for her. It, yeah, that's it's really yeah. really. I think the idea, mind. the idea also is, mm -hmm. um, and I would like to reassure um, uh, um, her that the idea is that you've got it at home, you can call an ambulance. And then if it needs, if the ambulance crew feel it needs to be given, it can be administered by the ambulance crew. But um, I, I really don't think, and I wouldn't say it if I, if I wouldn't really believe it, um, I really don't think that, that high levels of anxiety in relation to adrenal crisis are, um, are required. I think the, the importance is to be aware of it and to alert medical professionals if there, if there is concern. Thank you, Dr. Spinty. Um, have a question um, now for Alison, um, from Rebecca, from her um, hospital bed. <laughs> well done for joining us, Rebecca. Um, so she's, um, she said she's mentioned it on previous chats with other physios, but um, like many other parents during lockdown, uh, we've seen some stiffness and decline within movement. Um, we're the same with, with our Samson. Um, does, do, I, do, do you have any advice on how to try to prevent this? Um, Alison, but also bearing in mind that um, we seem to struggle more with tiredness and lack of interest to do things too. So it's a real juggling act at the moment. I think we're, we're hearing lots and lots of parents uh, echoing those thoughts. So we'd love your input, Alison, on that, please. Yeah, it, it's really very, very difficult. Um, if you can at all follow the programmes that your community physio gave you to do, do it, but I understand that when you've not 
got much motivation because you're not doing what you would normally expect to be doing. It's very difficult to do. Um, contact your local physio if they haven't given you a standard program. They, most community physios are giving welfare telephone calls. I would hope that most of you have had a welfare call from your community physios. If not, get in touch with them and ask them to send you some program for your 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 boys to do. Um, motivating is really hard because you know when you're stuck in the house and not doing anything and you're not going places, you're not going to hydro, you're not meeting your friends, not playing out at school. It's all terribly, terribly difficult to motivate. It, I I don't have a magic motivational tool. Um, I wish I did, but. But really, it's it get out in the garden and, and do as much as you can with them and, and try to be the friend substitute, the, the schoolmate substitute, um, and, and try and find imaginative, imaginative ways of doing things. Paddling pools, um, if the weather's warm. I'm just looking at the thunderstorm raging outside my window at the moment. Um, and, but out in the garden, if you can, possibly get them out in the garden every day and doing some form of aerobic exercise every day is really, really important. Um, hopefully you've got stretch, stretches from your local physios as well that you can do. But I, again, appreciate that when that there isn't much going on, it, it's very, very hard to motivate your children. And we're going to have to step up once things go back to normal and um, uh, get heart back to hydrotherapy, which is wonderful for getting everybody going again. Um, but it, 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 it is quite worrying, but I, I would urge you to contact your community physio and let them know. Um, and if you have no contact for your community physio, contact your tertiary centre physio, um, because they will want to know and they will give you something to do from the tertiary centre, so where you go to see your consultant, yeah. Um, but I wish there was a magic answer, but it's very, very difficult. Yeah, thanks, Alison. Um, this was a big discussion point. We had, um, I think it was the second session with uh, Marion Maine, um, and we were talking about making stretches fun, um, and that's had kind of record number of hits on our YouTube. Um, people are just desperate to find a way of, of making it kind of engaging for the children. Um, um, and, I, and I can say there's some really smashing um, exercises on there. It certainly has grown our repertoire, you know, our community physio, really, we, we often kind of show them um, what yeah, I mean, Marian, it's cutting edge, you know. It's Marion's <laughs> tutorial was brilliant, wasn't it? So, um, but yeah. it, it is, it, it's hard, and I know the longer it goes on, the harder it is to, to find the imagination to work around things mm. and to get it fun. Um, mm. and, and it, it's, I mean, it's dull at the best of times, let's be honest, doing your exercises and, and doing stretches is dull at the best of times, but at least when you've got other rewards for doing it, like going out and going places and playing with your friends, it makes it easier. Um, I, 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 gave a, I gave a nice life hack, um, Alison. Sorry to, 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 to jump over you then. I think my line snapped a little bit. Um, a little life hack for the swimming pool. You can get a little attachment to your hose, which attaches to um, the shower cable. Um, so you can actually put hot water into your swimming pool or your paddling swimming pool, paddling pool via the shower. So that's how we've been getting hot water into the pool. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a life. Right. Yeah. Um, Leanne said bubbles and balloons for the younger boys. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and she also asked if um, Alison can can we access kind of static type equipment for our boys. It's where you'd get it from, to be quite honest. We don't we don't have stashes at the hospitals now. Again, your community therapist might might let you take some stuff from their centres because they're not using it because there's not many community physios working at the moment, actively working. Um, so it's worth the conversation with your your local physio and asking him is to have you got equipment back in a department somewhere not being used? Could we borrow it? I, I, I would be open to that, but. It would obviously it's up to each individual um, therapy team whether they would or not. Um, but static equipment is great, I and mean, you can get the hand cycles and pedal cycles and things like that um, relatively cheaply. But you know it's not really the time to be spending a lot of money on equipment that you won't use um, very often. 
Um, I think for bigger equipment, um, certainly people have been looking into the family fund, haven't they? There's a new um, COVID-19 family fund being launched. So that's a yeah. good one to look at for larger. But then, of course, it's the timing, isn't it? And allowing people into your house, the shielding and its additional complications. So the answer it is, certainly is a lot there. There's a lot to consider. But if you think about things like the foot, the, you know, the, the pedals, like the static pedal cycles that you put on the floor, you can also turn the, turn them right down and use them for your hands as well. Um, and, and just try your very, very best to motivate. But I do appreciate it's very, very difficult, very difficult indeed. The static cycle is a really good point. So would you recommend something like that? Yeah, a static cycle. Or have you seen the ones that, that are just a set of pedals? So you can get them that's, that's not actually a bike, it's just a set of pedals where you can alter the resistance and you can use those with your hands or your feet or both. Okay. Um, they're really good. Uh, and they're not that expensive. And again, your local physiotherapist may have one in a cupboard that she's prepared to lend you. So, you know, it's always worth asking. That's a very good point. I can see that they're going to be um, selling out quickly after this. <laughs> Yeah, no, you can get them Amazon. on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, good yeah. old Amazon. You can get them on those. Um, so don't forget Amazon Smile and choose Action Duchenne when you go on Amazon Smile, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Were there, were there any other questions from um, the team? We've had a nice um, from the team from the uh, from the participants. We've had some lovely kind of um, points raised um, and sharing on the chat as you've been. Um, as you've been presenting. Has anybody got any further questions? Um, um, Linda Smith has asked, that's my mum actually, <laughs> has asked, um, are there any safety issues with this equipment? Um, so, you know, with obviously with the kind of, you have to limit, limit the amount of time that you're using the, the cycles, etc. Yes, it, it's like everything. We would have said to all of our, our, our boys that, do it in little and often and don't have your resistance set too high. So if you keep your sessions short, um, don't work them to exhaustion and don't let them carry on when you think you can see that they're starting to fade. As soon as the quality of the movement starts going off, then you stop. Um, but I'd much rather, my boys did three sessions of five minutes a day than one session of 15 minutes a day. So work on the little and often principle. Um, Obviously, if you're thinking about a proper bike, you need to make sure that, that it's safe for your child to sit on a, a proper static bike because they don't usually have a great deal of support to them. Thank you. Um, Susan has asked, um, if the appointment time is significantly delayed, um, do the centres get in touch and let the parents know? Yeah, so um, from our point of view, we haven't stopped the, the steroid clinic or the, the outpatient appointments. We've just converted them um, from face-to-face -to, -face to, um, um, to telemedicine appointments. So um, ideally, there shouldn't be delay in the appointments. There might, of course, be a little bit once things were set up. Um, and we are keeping, at our unit, we are keeping a list and keeping an eye on who set an appointment and when. Um, where there will be a delay is, is for assessment from the cardiac point of view or the DEXA scans or blood tests, which I've, um, which I've discussed. And what we have done, and I'm, I'm sure that the other units are doing in a very similar way, is um, to screen those where something is more important. So somebody who has, for example, just started an ACE inhibitor, it's more important that the renal function is checked earlier rather than later. But in, if um, somebody who's been established for years on an ACE inhibitor, it isn't really that important to check the renal function once we know that um, it has been normal on the dose the, the boys have been on. So they, in short, the answer is that the, the units together with the families should keep an eye on it. And if you're, concerned, if you're concerned that an appointment or a test is too delayed, I would just phone up the, the respective center and double check with them. Okay, great. Yeah, I would, I would say that again. We're, we're trying, it's certainly in our unit, we're trying to keep on track with all our assessments and, and our clinic visits. But if, if you have concerns, don't sit at home and worry ring. Thank you so much. Um, 
everybody it's been wonderful to see you all thank you so much for coming on this this evening and a special thanks to our wonderful guest speakers dr Cynthia and alison thank you we really do appreciate it your time is incredibly precious and no uh, yeah as always thank you for your for everything you do for our families and for our, our young people so thank you everybody um, I'm glad we've got the tech working. Hooray! <laughs> Don't forget, please do fill in your feedback forms that I'll be sending out tomorrow morning. We've, the next um, um, online session we have is Relax and Chill, the last session in the series. <laughs> and then we've got Physio. Don't forget, I'm living as an adult with Dishen, um, with Brian, and also finding a job and working when you live with a disability. So, thank you all. Go and thank enjoy you your evenings. Much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much.